This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. Thanks for downloading Grilled by The Stuff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Stuff Canteen, and in this episode, our founder, Mark Morris, discusses the Agriculture Bill. Last week, MPs voted against a new clause in the Agriculture Bill, which would have guaranteed no dilution of food and animal welfare standards in the UK. A very disappointing result for many and equally worrying. But what is the Agriculture Bill? What does it entail? What can be done to guarantee the interests of British farmers, suppliers and end users? As we set out to renegotiate all trade after leaving the European Union, Britain will, for the first time since the 1970s, be free to choose its own farming practices. But the proposed bill also sets out the possibility of foreign trade deals, which could force the UK to accept the import of produce which doesn't meet the current British farming standards. The bill attempts to reform inefficient farming practices and change how subsidies are handed out, as well as laying out a seven-year revision of sustainable practices. But for some, the bill fell short of expectations. Firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Mark from the Staff Canteen. I'm the founder of the Staff Canteen. Um, Today is a live panel discussion. Uh, We've got an amazing panel of guests who I'm going to allow to introduce themselves very shortly. But today we're going to be talking about what the impact of a potential US-UK trade deal could look like and what the impact of that could be on farmers, growers, importers, um, and of course the consumer, us as consumers, uh, both in terms of chefs and the end user. Uh, There's been a lot of talk in the press, some scary headlines. Uh, Lots of people will have heard things such as chlorinated chicken, pesticides, they would have heard of things uh, hormone uh, injected beef, all of which sounds very, very scary. So today we've got a panel of guests and I'm going to start, I know this probably looks different on everyone's screen, but I'm going to start with my top left. Uh, I've got Bruce Rene from the shore in Penzance. Bruce, introduce yourself to everyone. Yep, yeah, I'm uh, Bruce Rennie. I'm chef owner of uh, the Shore in Penzance, a very small restaurant. Um, main focus being on welfare concerns um, and local produce. And that's my big thing. Fantastic. Again, as I go round, next on my screen is you, Peter. Hi, uh, my name is Peter Pickering. I'm a private chef. I've been a chef in the UK for the past 16 years. Um, I should also mention that I've recently started a petition calling for food to be clearly labelled if it doesn't meet our EU standards after Brexit. Thank you, Peter. Moving around, I've got Nick. Nick, hi. Uh, Hi, afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Allen. I'm Chief Executive of the British Meat Process Association. We, uh, our members probably supply uh, 90% of the, or handle 90% of the the, the pork, um, 80% of the beef and about 65% of the lambs in in the country supplying the sort of retailers and the food service sector. We're also involved in imports and exports. Uh, and for my sins, I'm also a farmer as well. <laughs> for your sins? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I must have done something really bad in life to have this job and, and to be a farmer. <laughs> and last, but by certainly by no means least, right at the bottom of my screen as I look at my screen is Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Yep, uh, Daniel Metheringham uh, from McCain Foods. We're the largest purchaser of British potatoes in the UK. Um, we deal direct with over 250 growers um, across the UK, uh, including a seed supply in, in Scotland, many stretching back three generations. And, and honestly, we, we see them part of the uh, McCain family. Um, we're serving retail, uh, quick service restaurants and food service outlets. And um, yeah, we're, we're heavily impacted with COVID and we know this is also coming down the line and um, the, the challenges that the, the growers have faced over the last couple of years. Um, we've really got to make sure they're there for the long term. Brilliant. Well, thank you all very much for introducing yourself. I think everybody knows um, who you are and you, and you bring a great deal of knowledge to the panel. So I'm really looking forward to this. So just as a quick overview, we're going to be talking primarily about the agricultural bill today. Um, let me start by uh, the government said in its, uh, in its manifesto when it was elected, uh, and it, was, it, it said that it would not undermine food standards with lower quality imports in any process post-Brexit deal. Now, the Agricultural Bill um, has had its uh, two readings in Parliament. Uh, It's now in the House of Lords. 
Um, it's at the committee stage, uh, and that is a line by line examination of the bill, and that's scheduled for the 7th of July. Um, Nick, I think I'll start with you. What, what is your understanding of the agricultural bill and what potentially could um, relaxations in some of the standards that are in the uh, agricultural bill, especially around um, animal welfare and, and, and the safety of anim uh, animal husbandry and all of the things that you're involved in? What, what, could it, what could it potentially mean if we do a deal with the US? Yeah, I, I mean, I watch the uh, agricultural bill debates that go through the House of Commons the other day with interest, really. And, and uh, it, it was great to see uh, that so many MPs speaking up and actually sort of talking about and wanting to actually put Neil Parrish's uh, amendments uh, and get them through and sort of built into that sort of bill. Uh, and and I re actually thought watching the sort of debate that it was that they were going to get it, you know, but clearly the government stepped in uh, and put us off, you know, you know, so the, the government whip in and um, uh, those were all sort of ruled out. Now, interesting enough, I, I spoke to a couple of MPs after uh, sort of the debate to sort of say, well, what went what went wrong there? Uh, one of them I sort of spoke to had absolutely abst uh, had abstained um, and, uh, you know, he ducked either sort of, you know, upsetting the government or, or you know, but he wanted, he wanted to vote for those amendments, but he, he ended up abstaining. And I asked him why. Um, he said, well, he'd spoken to Liz Truss, who was the, the you know, sort of um, head of DIT in, involved in the trade deals. And I thought it was really worrying his, this, this answer. She said to him, look, if we have all these restrictions in the bill, um, the, uh, we'll, we'll have to go and inspect these countries and, uh, you know, we'll have to go and inspect what's coming here. And I, I found that really worrying. Of yeah. course, you are bloody going to have to go and inspect <laughs> the, the America. If we want to export to America, the Americans are going to have to come over here and inspect our plants and sort of do it. And I was actually mortified that this MP actually sort of bought this. I was, uh, and clearly in their thinking is that they, they don't actually intend to police too much, you know, uh, and, and put too much resources into sort of policing as to what comes in here. And I, I found that discussion really, really concerning as to what's going on, you know. I, I can understand that probably the bill may not be sort of technically the right place for those amendments. Um, but I thought what went on around it, I thought I was encouraged by the MPs, um, but I was really worried the fact that it, you know, the, the government, you know, sort of put three lines of whip in. And I, I worry really that uh, I'm not sure that the government really know enough about trade negotiations uh, to get this right. You know, it's. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that, that really bothers me. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, from your perspective, as I said, sort of at the start of this, it's, it's you know, there's been lots of headlines around chlorinated chicken and, and, and hormone injected beef. That, that seems to be quite attention grabbing, but it's not just the livestock industry. Clearly, you know, there are farmers, there are growers. How could it potentially impact you guys at McCain? Yeah, um, it, there's a lot, a lot of challenges. And I think um, you look back over, certainly within our sector, the potato sector, uh, the challenges that have been faced uh, climate wise um, and the climate extremes and the impact that's had on on the potato crop, followed by by COVID. Now, with, within McCain, similar international company, and, and we certainly support free trade, but it is about that that level playing field, uh, making sure those standards are, are, are sort of equal uh, subsidies are equal uh, across all these different areas and um, I think you know what what's encouraging is the focus on sustainability and some of the work that's going on there um, but it, but it really is to be cost competitive and I think you outlaid that um, at the start quite nicely to be com cost competitive um, we, we have got to create uh, that level playing field and at the moment uh, that ag bill doesn't represent that in any way so I think to to echo some of Nick's Nick's thoughts there um, really seeing that sort of uh, providence piece um, the level playing field in, in whatever way whether that's um, health and safety or food standards it's absolutely critical we get get some sort of recognition in there um, in, into the into that bill Bruce thank you thank you Daniel Bruce, I'm going to come on to you. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're down there right on the end of the world, down there, or right on the end of the country. Um, yeah. You know, you can, you can drop a line into the sea and, and pull out fresh fish. 
So how worrying is it for you when you hear things that, you know, we could potentially be taking in um, chlorinated chicken? And let's, let's just explain a little, I mean, chlorinated chicken is, uh, the reason it's chlorinated, it's 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 banned in the EU, it's banned in the in the EU currently. The reason it's chlorinated is the farming practices of a lot of chlorinated chicken are pretty poor. Um, they're in incredibly refined spaces, often standing in their own feces for hours on end. Uh, the reason they're chlorinated is to kill or at best mask bacteria that's in the chicken. So how do you feel about that? Bruce, as a as a as a chef, that could potentially that could be coming into your into your supply chain. I know you've got a choice to use it or not. Yeah. It could be coming well, into I'm, your supply chain. Yeah. I, I'm incredibly aware of this, um, and it's been a big part of uh, my life. My my wife is a vet, and her she did several degrees and a PhD. Her PhD was in animal welfare, um, so it's a big part of what drives me. Now, I made, I made a decision a few years ago not to use meat because I was still trying to work out my sensitivities. And, and now I've seen that there's a slight um, hypocrisy in just using fish. Uh, so I'm going back to meat. And this is partially in response to the loose terminology around this part of the agri bill. Um, I'm going to support local farmers. I'm going to buy direct and support from people that I can verify the welfare standards on their sites. Um, uh, you know, so UK based certainly, but primarily start from base point and then move out. With that comes a cost. Now, where I live, uh, where we are, where I operate, it's highly seasonal. The socioeconomic factors are really restrictive and really tight and people can't afford much. So I understand the um, after the war, how we had this push to mass farming, this sort of um, and uh, monocropping and all this sort of stuff. I, I understand how that goes, but but we're starting to see the offshoots of that with uh, soil erosion, degradation of soil productivity. You know, the replenishment of soil is about hundred times less than we're actually using, or ten to hundred times, depends which uh, which uh, references you draw. But essentially. The methods of farming, I believe, that we are producing to produce the amount of food that we're, we're trying to re rely on, it's not sustainable. Um, so the price needs to be looked. I think one of the biggest issues we've got is people are too willing to pay cheap produce and overlook these welfare issues. Um, even though they know it, there was a TED talk by some marketing woman, I can't recall the name straight off now, but I've put a link on it earlier um, on my social media platforms. But um, the biggest issue is public uh, awareness, public response and public responsibility for buying these things. So I, I think for me, having the guidelines in place are quite important because it gives us something that we have to work to. Um, but I, I think leaving it loose and open, it's like the COVID thing, lifting the lockdown and expecting people to do the right thing. We've all seen that doesn't work. Um, people will choose the easiest option, the most selfish option as a, a very generalization, sort of a big statement there, but I like to be provocative and, and create discussion and debate. Um, I choose to do what I believe is right until someone proves me wrong or gives me another option that I think is better. I think this, um, the bill has many good perspectives about it, many good uh, points, um, looking at the sustainability and how farmers operate and, and the way the handouts are awarded. I think there's a seven year plan to sort of transition period between the old payments and, and the move on to the new ones, Yeah. Um, how it's paid to landowners. But I think it'll be interesting to see how it goes on, but I understand the impact and, and the financial aspect of it all. But I can deal with that. Um, you know, I'd rather eat less meat more often, but of a better quality than cheap, ready-made stuff. We'll come on. We'll come on to pricing in a, in a second because I think that is very, very important to understand. Uh, Peter, just to bring you into the debate, um, you felt quite strongly about this, and you've been using your social channels to uh, raise awareness, and, and by doing so, you've created a, a, a campaign, and there's been other campaigns in in the marketplace as well. So, so just talk us through a little bit about what what your position is and what you're trying to do. Right. Well, um, my main concern is about the transparency of these products and for consumers right across the line. Um, like you say, I started a petition um, insisting that any food standards that fall below our current standards 
should be clearly labeled stating this. Um, it's con as consumers, it's our choice. It, we, we should have the choice not to buy, be able to buy these foods. Uh, and they must be labeled so that we can make an informed choice. Um, but where I'm concerned about is schools, hospitals, you know, you're not gonna know if these are going there. We, we need that transparency there. But going on to um, back to the quality of the food um, in terms of the, the beef industry or the, or the meat in industry in the US, um, just consider this, two thirds of the antibiotics in the US get used in the meat industry. And that is to counteract the diseases caused by growth hormones and poor hygiene. Um, in the cattle industry alone, the, the, in the US, uh, they use on average 10 times the dose of antibiotics per cow compared to the UK. Now, the World Health Organization identifies antimicrobial resistance as one of the greatest global threats we face. So that is basically superbugs being created by the overuse of antibiotics. Now, 33,000 people in Europe die every year because of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And we've had a huge movement in this country, um, so much time and money invested in reducing the overuse of antibiotics in the NHS, in the farming industry. The whole Brexit campaign was about investing more in the NHS. So the fact that government is on the verge of allowing these products onto our market is absolutely ridiculous and totally irresponsible. Peter, uh, uh, sorry, Nick, Nick, sorry, my apologies. As, as uh, you know, as, 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 as the CEO of the British Meat Producers Association, you know, some of those things that Peter said there, I mean, th that sounds really worrying. Yeah, <clears throat> and I, you know, I alluded earlier that I'm, I'm worried that the government really doesn't understand what they got into. So let's pick up what Peter sort of said about um, uh, hormone beef and pick up this sort of subject. At the moment, uh, despite you know what he says about it, so the WTO actually you know regard that as acceptable. So Europe's ban on it, you know, which we live under at the moment, is uh, you know sort of um, uh, the Americans are compensated by that. So there's a quota that comes into sort of Europe by um, uh, uh, from other other countries, you know, sort of, tar uh, sort of tariff free that because can meat beef can come in from outside Europe, and to compensate the Americans for that ban, which WTO decided was sort of, uh, sort of illegal, um, the, the Europeans have given gave the Americans a bigger share of that that um, that that quota. Now, when we step outside Europe, <laughs> we we can't actually, despite the governments and Liz Truss sort of and, and saying, actually, it's, don't worry about it, guys. You, we're going to uh, have European regulations. They, in this deal, are going to actually have to ha face down the Americans, and, and the Americans are going to be saying, Europe's compensate us for <laughs> for what happened. What what are you going to do in return for that? We're going to be on our own. It's going to be the same story about chlorinated chicken. Just saying we are going to follow the same regulations as Europe does not mean, you know, uh, that, you, you know, that they then got to defend it and justify it. And I don't actually think that they fully understand what they're sort of getting involved in, you know, and, and, it, and it really worries me that it could open the door to this, uh, you know, this, this stuff, you know, because it's, uh, I don't believe our consumer wants it over here. I think all the surveys suggest that they've, um, uh, they, they certainly don't want it. But as, uh, as Bruce alluded to earlier, once price becomes a factor and this start, stuff starts to appear on the shelves uh, at, a, at a low price, it becomes very, very difficult to, you know, uh, if, you, if you're hard up to resist it, really. You know, so, and, and um, you know, so, you know, I think they've got a real problem with that. Sorry. So I've probably gone into far too much detail. No, no, not at all. I no, not at all. I, I, I think it's really, really interesting. Daniel, I just want to bring you in. Obviously, as I said, right at the, the onset of this, chlorinated chicken and hormone uh, injected beef has kind of grabbed the headlines but underneath all of that you know there are uh, GMO crops uh, increased pesticides you know so what, is, what does it mean from your perspective you know to, to sort of the farmers and the growers what are, what are the risks and what, what, are, what could the impact be on you know British growers yeah, I think it's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, it's been touched on by both uh, Bruce and, and Peter. I think, you know, in the UK, we, we've got 
great standards and i think the the the, the growers uh, currently you know they are stewardships uh, stewardship of the land and i think we're already on the journey um it was mentioned earlier about soil and i think yeah, the crop rotation and the work that's going on there uh, looking at water optimization and, and making sure what we put on the field uh, with regards to water etc stays on the field it, it's all really sort of you know great work and and what we should be looking is it is promoting that um across the piece and i think within the ag bill there needs to be greater clarity on on the metrics uh and and define what measure public goods you know what, what does that actually mean um because again i think it, it was touched on that basically that subsidy and the way it's going to get paid out I, I think growers can work it to their advantage but i go back to the level playing field but uh, a sort of final point is very much around government procurement and a really interesting point peter to raise you know government into to schools hospitals they do mm. have a choice um and what choice are they going to make are they going to support british agriculture or are, are they going to just basically support cheap food at lower standards so i think that government procurement piece is a, a, a really interesting one but i think i, I echo you know we do some great things in the in in the uk and we don't promote ourselves enough and this is a time that we've got to get that voice heard i think there's a willingness um especially post covid uh, to do that i think there was a fact i saw the other day you know 60 percent of um a british public want to buy british more now than than ever so i think that food security you know there's a rhetoric out there and uh, you know certainly companies like ourselves that have been supporting british for uh, numerous years now it, it is about getting behind that um, and making sure our voice is heard let's talk yeah no, sorry no, go on nick so just before I, I, and I'll, I'll be brief let's just no, make general comments about the the agriculture bill because we, we sort of leapt in straight away about the sort of the trade issues um, <laughs> I, I was really disappointed in that bill, per se, you know, to be honest, that the, the, the first introduction of it did hardly mention food production at all. Then they took a bit of flack and then they that they, they sort of tweaked it to sort of put that, you know, sort of fit in a bit about that sort of agriculture and yeah, food production. It is important. And for goodness sake, if anything, we've learned through this COVID sort of crisis is food sustainability is important. And I still don't think there's enough in there. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, this is a fan, This is the first time we, we've had the opportunity to write our own agricultural sort of bill for 40 years actually this is a fantastic opportunity for this country to show the world how to do it how to uh you get sustainability and sensible you know good agricultural sort of productions sort of, and uh, uh and to my mind that bill falls way short and, and and one of the things it failed to address is the elephant in the room which is actually farming itself needs to go through a massive restructuring um uh, and it's something that no one ever wants to talk about. The NFU never wants to talk about it because, you know, they lose members. The levy bodies never want to sort of face up to it. But it's the elephant in the room that everyone ever talks about. The structure of our agriculture does not necessarily make us that competitive on a worldwide basis. So really interesting ranting. point. Thank, thank you. Uh, so to, to go back to price then, I mean, there's a saying of, uh, and, and I always get this around the wrong way, why, why does real food cost so much? And, and really the question should be, why does processed food cost so little? You know, we often see, and I'm sure as chefs you get, you know, why do you charge that for this? Um, so if, if we start looking at, at, at cost, choice is a good thing, okay? Choice is a good thing. It gives consumers options. But if we see a market that is flooded with cheaper products, does it then become simply a race to the bottom around welfare standards? And, and Peter, your point was fascinating uh, and you picked up on it, Daniel, as well. You know, when it comes down to the procurement, uh, and, and I hadn't thought of this, schools, hospitals, prisons, are they just going to be buying chicken on the lowest cost possible? And what could that potentially mean? Do you want to start with that, Bruce? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It was one of the first things I thought of. Um, you know, everyone knows about what Jamie Oliver, etc., have been saying about school meals and whatnot. But but the reality is that you know I, I've seen it in my kids' school, which is a tiny school with seventy pupils. Um, when they put the meals out for tender, what they're getting is appalling, and and the quality of the produce and everything else that's coming in there is horrendous. Now, thankfully, 
their school has a, a polytunnel. So they're doing bits and pieces. And obviously my kids are working with me, seeing the stuff growing there. But but you know fine well, that as soon as you put something out to tender like that, and we have a back door that's open for this sort of produce to come in, regardless of the letters I've seen, some of my suppliers being sent by the government uh, stating that they will stick to the existing uh, standards. That's all talk. I mean, all, all the wording, from what I believe, all the wording that is in this new Agri Bill, I think the last one was 73, was it? But the new one, um, all the wording is more of, uh, it's enabling uh, legislation, so it's not actually something they have to act on. It's a, it's a promissory note saying, yeah, we'll do the best, but the, the, there's no set standards to adhere to. Now, if you do not have any standards like that, it's all going to. It's going to leave the floodgates open, and it's going to leave it open for deceit and and obviously uh, occasion. You know, it'll all be hidden in sort of smoke and mirrors. So, I think I think once you get that into the system, then then you know that that's going to become the norm because it's always about capitalism. It's always about looking after reducing the cost for the hospital. We need to save this much to allow us to spend this much there. So, you know, the bottom line is we've got to feed people, but how can we do it on the cheapest? basis possible and it, it it's logic i mean it's not just a nefarious sort of thinking that leads people down this route people want to make money so they want to save money in other areas and they're going to do it yeah. regardless of and will appease their own conscience by saying well it's allowed so it must be okay um whereas i don't operate like that but that's me you know i i, I, I buy my flour from a mill in cambridge uh, which is UK organic flour. Organic not because I think it's better for our bodies, because our bodies can deal with any amount of crap we throw at them, <clears throat> but organic because it's good for the environment and the ecosystem. That's what organic is. Um, but not everything can be that way, I understand, but that's my choice. Um, and I've got principles. No, 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 and there's nothing. Peter, for, for, as I say, you know, talk, talking of price and cost, you know, if, if we see a market flooded with cheap products, two things could happen is, you know, we get a cheap product running, but it could potentially push prices up on the other end to compensate for those losses. So how, how could that um, possibly affect yourself? I mean, in terms of myself, I'm like Bruce. I don't eat meat that often. I, I, I you know, I, I, I'd rather go for organic, good quality meat, have it once every week or every fortnight. Um, in terms of, I don't think we'll see too much change in sort of the high-end restaurants, I think we all sort of, um, you know, we'll, we'll stay clear of that. But if you look at things like the fast food sector, where if you have American chains, which have links to America, um, yeah, links to the US where they can get their, their burgers and their chickens for a fifth of the price, um, it is, is very worrying. Um, I think the NFU have called for an independent food and farming standards commission to be set up, which I think the government's been very reluctant at the moment. But I think I think we do need something which isn't. Um, we can't have ministers deciding what our food standards are. We yeah. should have an independent union set up made by food experts, um, <laughs> scientists who look at animal welfare, uh, talk to the farmers, look at uh, environmental impacts and how we can. Um, farm greener with greener methods and give guidance to the government and if we do set tariffs based it should be uh, through the an independent body um nick i'll come to i'll come to you first you you represent seventy five thousand members you know that's that's an awful lot of people um well, that, well that's that staff not um not, not actual members I, I, okay okay <laughs> um, <laughs> But if, if the market is flooded with cheaper produce, you know, does that put livelihoods under threat? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, um, uh, as I say, I mean, there's a worry enough, as I alluded to earlier, about the competitiveness of British agriculture. And, and that's not being unkind to sort of farmers. We, we've got a massive, the, you know, our factory floor costs more than, 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 than most other parts of the world. You know, the price of land, you know, just for starters. But, yeah. um, you know, we have got a competitive issue. So, you know, we're not that competitive in the first place at the moment, which, you know, as I said earlier, needs a sort of dressing. Um, but then if actually, yes, we're, we're flooded by uh, sort of import that actually um, you know, are not produced to the standards that we're asking our farmers and our factories to you know to work at 
uh, yeah, it, it, it can only be disastrous sort of, sort of for us. And, and you know, so the, uh, you know, sort of, and, and you, 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 it's a job to look forward and a, a lot, lot job to look at that agriculture bill and look at where we're going and, and be t that optimistic that actually agriculture and certainly the meat sector is, is whether it's going to sort of grow or not, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, so uh, you, if you look at the sort of politicians we've got in power at the moment, they, um, and I'm not wanting to take this in a political debate, but if you look at the, 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 the influencers, they've all subscribed in the past to actually sort of buying on the, on the world market cheaply you know and, and keeping the price of food down and you know look at sort of papers that Michael Gove was involved in in the past and things like that they've all subscribed to that their basic philosophy has always been uh yeah look we can buy food cheaper than we can actually you know produce it at home here yes. so yeah it's it's it's, it's worrying and our, our members are worried about it yes. I can imagine it's like Bruce said capitalism always seems to drive everything doesn't it um, Daniel for yourself I mean we've talked about the sort of fast food industry and we were sort of talking before we went uh, online, is often in uh, socially deprived areas. Um, it, it's it's very well known that as 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 areas uh, with lower income families in, you know, you tend to see an onset of betting shops, and you then tend to see an onset of of fast food restaurants. They don't tend to be the branded restaurants. They tend to be the sort of more independent. Now, you know, I suspect an awful lot of chips are sold. Um, and, and for someone like yourself in McCain's, you know, if, if I can buy a potato at half the price that McCain's are going to do it, you know, there's got to be a massive incentive for me to buy at that price. Um, can you see a real challenge in some of those sort of faster food outlets that they're not really going to be worried that it's grown in the UK? It hasn't been treated with excessive pesticides um, and they are just going to buy on price and what the impact therefore could be. From, from a, you know, from a business perspective and the possibility of a livelihood perspective for people that you guys employ. Yeah, and, and I think, look, it's um, a, a real sort of valid point as far as, um, you know, price is important and it doesn't matter what business you are, including our, our farmers, they've, they've got to generate a profit, otherwise they won't be here. And, and I think, you know, uh, already we have a large percentage, over 50% of uh, frozen French pork fries are already imported from Europe. And I think uh, Nick mentioned at the start, uh, halfway through there around the ag bill and the focus on, uh, on on food. And I think we do really have a choice is, is do we want uh, our farmers to be growing food? And that seem, might seem like a ridiculous statement right now, but it, it really is a decision that we, we are, are facing into. And, and certainly from my perspective, um, and, and this isn't just with a, a, a McCain hat on, is um, you know, with what we've experienced over the last three months, that food security is as important as ever. And we, we really have got to get the government uh, to recognize the, the, the food security um, mo moving forward. And I think, you know, um, as Peter sort of referenced there as well, um, I think there's a, a bit of a, more of an opportunity with um, the national food strategy to, to tie a few of these things in as well. Um, but it, it shouldn't be a straight compromise. I think, you know, good agricultural practices can also lower the price you know, better utilisation, as I said, whether it's water optimization, using technology, joining all of that together. So you've got a progressive business that is more sustainable and also lower cost. But again, we go back to it. It has to be done by a level playing field. Um, Nick mentioned he didn't want to politicise this, but one thing that's been going through my mind is that there was a there was a slogan, get Brexit done. Uh, we've, we've left the EU. And it almost seems like now that the government are hell bent on whatever the EU did of just discarding it. Um, and it almost feels to me like this agricultural bill, you know, it's on, on paper, it seems like a very good thing of all the things that you guys have discussed already. Um, there's some very, very important safeguards in there around animal welfare, husbandry, supply chain, uh, all of those type of things. It, it just seems like if you go to the US, for a deal we're in a quite a weak position because the us know we need a deal we need a trade deal so it seems to be able to hold the upper hand and say well okay you want to deal with these are our terms but, you know is it inevitable that this is going to happen 
Bruce, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with it completely. I, I, think, I think if we don't have legislation in place, um, there's a bloody mindedness. And, and I laughed earlier at, at Peter saying experts because the whole phrase, the thing I remember everyone saying was, sod the experts, we don't care about the experts. Hang on, there's a reason people are experts. Now, our country, the UK used to be, uh, and still are, I, I, I dare say, actually, uh, at the head of welfare standards, we were the pioneering, you know, my wife was involved with it, she went off to Italy, she went off to um, the Netherlands on all these conferences. I learned a lot from that, um, and, and how well regarded. We were the flagship, flying the flag for welfare practices in the world. Now, all of a sudden, the thing, one of the biggest things that, that triggered my sort of awareness of everyone was when they started declassifying animals as sentient humans or sentient beings sorry um that in essence said told me everything i needed to know is that when they the, said they don't have feelings yeah no they declassified them as sentient uh, which, which basically means that we can do what we want to them without yes. uh, concerns about welfare because they're not real beings I, that's you know, it they, they, that's they, it yes don't have sensitivities no. Anyone that works with animals, any farmer will tell you that the whole point is that animals are the key to everyone, giving them good welfare, everyone else, it produces a much better product. And apart from anything, we've got a responsibility for our planet to do this. When you see what mass industrial farming, some of the huge farms have done, I mean, I've, I've watched so many videos, I've read so many books about uh, environmental impact and, and stuff like that. And there are some very common threads, but one of the biggest things is that we, we we need to have it down in legislation that we cannot move away from. Because if we just open the choice up to the public, with a, and I love Peter's idea about the labeling and making it, but it needs to be at the forefront of what we do. People need to take it on the chin and say, I'm, I'm going to buy poor quality, cheap stuff at a poor price. But you know, when I see myself putting my products up against a local restaurant that has that is buying king prawns in from Thailand and stuff like that, and I'm using fresh local produce, people need to understand, they can't look at me and go, well, why is yours so expensive? And, and, and there's isn't, well, because I believe in using the best quality produce and supporting my local community and the British industries. And, and that's, that's my belief. You know, the, I, I think Daniel mentioned earlier that, you know, we're suddenly aware of it that once things happen, we have no security. If we stop our farmers growing and producing what we need to to try and sort of maintain ourselves, at least on a certain level, you know, if something goes wrong, we're open to, you know, we have no strength in trade deals. We have nothing to barter with if we have primarily imported goods. Now, there needs to be a balance, obviously, but we need to be proud of what we do, proud of our own producers and suppliers. I mean, some of these guys are amazing. And I think we could be a world leader. But yeah, you know, um, Nick said it does need restructuring. Even I can see that as a chef. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in it. Yeah. Um, Nick, you, you mentioned you've been following sorry, the Agri Book. Daniel was looking to come in there. Actually. Oh, sorry. So, sorry. No, just, I just, just, my apologies. Yeah. Go for it, Daniel. No, no, no. Just, just one point. I think uh, you, you say about once growers have stopped growing. Uh, just to, to echo that point again, um, what, once they have took the decision to convert land or, or let's say just step away from one sector, let's say it be potatoes, it's irreversible. And I, and I think that is a really, really key word there, because I think once a grower has taken that decision, decision to stop growing food, the investment cost, the infrastructure, the experience they have, you know, it will be lost so quickly and you, you will struggle to regain that in any way. And I think the consequence of that for the longer term, you know, again, we've really got to look at ourselves about the direction of travel. And I think the time is now, as, as I've already stated, I just thought it was worth commenting yeah, on absolutely. that. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. That was a really, really valid point. And uh, Nick, to come back to you then, you, you know, you, you've, you've been following the sort of debate in Parliament over the Agri-Bill and you've, you've been speaking to some, some politicians. Um, I, I don't really know what, what it means when it says it's at the committee stage, but, you know, is this going to go, you know, is the, is the agriculture bill going to be thrown out? Is, is it going to go through? What, what's your gut feeling? It, it'll go through. They've got too much of a majority. It's, uh, you know, so um, uh, they're, they're absolutely rock solid. I mean, as I say, as I said, so this is inevitable. 
Uh, it's inevitable the bill's going to go through. That doesn't mean that our, our trading standards are going to go out the window because it doesn't get sort of altered according to that. It just means we've got to carry the fight somewhere else, you know, sort of, and, and sort of, and sort of keep, keep fighting and keep pushing for it, you know. So, but it's, uh, uh, so it's, it, it's not the end of the world that it, it's not included in that sort of bill. And it's good that it's getting so much publicity around it, you know. So, uh, um, but we've we just got to keep going with it, you know, sort of, and, and you know, not, not just you know but that, that bill will pretty much go through you know yes you know they've got too much of a majority and that's uh, and too many other problems to um to to, to not to impose a three-line whip on everyone that's, that's, uh, uh, so la last qu last question for you all then as, as it as it seems that this 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 is inevitable and, and 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 i'll start with you um daniel what would you like to see in place that rewards farmers growers fishermen you know what should we all be doing to ensure you know the the point where you made earlier that if we stop doing these things and we give the land over to something else we'll never go back you know you know that that that's that that never happens so what what should we all be doing is it is it is it more lobbying is it more petitions what what do we all need to do to make sure that the farmers and all of those great people that are passionate about what they do um, keep producing? Yeah, I, I, I think it is as simple as getting behind one message um, and, and that is back British. And I think, um, you know, regardless of, uh, and I do agree with Nick, I think it, it is as good as a done deal, but we still do have all choices. And I don't want to, um, underplay that price piece and we, we have got to be competitive this isn't about getting pricing up or anything else like that so we, we have got to be be competitive so that point around clear labeling understanding which companies are absolutely behind british and that their products are british um, and again that that labeling plays a key key part within it um, but promoting all of those businesses and, and a voice as one and i think that that has got to be a key fundamental and ultimately, um, you know, we've, we've got to keep lobbying government in, in along those lines. And uh, I go back to that government procurement as well. Um, the more voices that can be raised around uh, the government procurement policy as well to make sure that they are uh, walking the walk. I, I think that's absolutely critical as well, because that is our hospitals, our foods, uh, our schools where people don't actually have a choice. Um, the government are making that choice for them. So I, I think we've got to be very clear about some of the, 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 the goods that are going into those sectors as well. Brilliant, thank you. Peter. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with Daniel, um, definitely backing British um, produce. Um, but yeah, through clear labeling, having an independent, uh, an independent uh, commission in place, um, you know, we can't have ministers deciding what our food standards should be and that needs to be taken out of their power we you know um we need something to replace the european food safety authority which is what we're coming out of and i think definitely the main thing we can do is, is have an independent commission put in place and bruce for you for chefs is it is it a case of just not not using foreign imports i mean what what, what can you guys do as chefs I mean, I for me, I always work from base points. So I work from home. So I say, right, this is where I'm starting to buy my produce. And this is why. And I make it very clear to this stuff. So the, uh, I think I think what what we need is public awareness of their their own independent responsibilities as people, as as citizens of this great country that we're trying to promote. Now, regardless of how we voted we Brexit, etc. The whole point is we want, want to make our country great. We want to make it strong. We want to have stable livelihoods uh, and, and a decent quality of life. Now, for me, it's buying the best quality produce, supporting our local communities, keeping it keeping it within Britain. And, and that's, I think, making that loud and clear through labelling, as everyone said, and all these other, I completely agree. And I think our panel pretty much has all agreed. It's not a debate as much as a good discussion. I've learned some good key points and, and I'll be pushing forward with, with the use of some of these as well and touching base with some of these guys. And Nick, finally from you. Uh, yeah, I think it, what in an ideal world, what we want is the British consumer prepared and actually, you know, and want to pay more for British produce. Do you, you think know. that's going to happen, though? 
I mean, the that supermarkets a... play a big play a big role in that, don't they? Well, you can oh, go into a supermarket and see a chicken for three quid. That, and they you... have got their supermarkets have got a massive responsibility here, you know, to to, to step step up and actually sort of support uh, British agriculture. You know, absolutely sort of key key to it. You know, and and uh, uh, if if they want um. Uh, and, and that they can be the most demanding of the lot in terms of all these well, well, welfare standards. Actually, it's it's um, uh, and, and I think I think if that sort of, sort of pressure is there, but uh, yeah, you know, w w will they? I don't know. But we have to aspire to the British consumer uh, appreciating British, you know, the, the quality of British food and being prepared to sort of pay more for it. And we certainly need to make sure that they've got the choice, you know, and and uh, it's it's very clearly labelled. I, and you know, and they understand, you know, so the the difference, you know, when they're buying cheaper, they understand why why it's cheaper, you know? and that's a massive educational sort of job. Yeah, you know, and it it, 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 it it does seem slightly mad, slightly ironic that you know we were we were all told we were going to be taking back control, and ultimately it looks like we're going to be losing a lot of control and putting British jobs and British workers' livelihoods really under threat which which i don't believe is what people voted for when they i don't want to make a brexit a, a remain or leave debate but it doesn't seem to be what what it was sold to people listen i've really 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 enjoyed today's debate you've all brought some really really interesting points to it um thank you all very much for your time starting with you in my top left bruce thank you very much nick Really, really interesting points. Thank you very much indeed. Peter, same to you. Thank you very much. The, the, uh, the, well, you touched on there about schools and hospitals. Uh, very, very important. That's something I consider. And Daniel, also from your own side, from the, from the sort of growing perspective. Thank you very much. You know, the, the insight you gave there about um, if we move away from certain things, we don't go back. I think, you know, is, is, is probably the thing that I'm going to take away from this debate. Thank you all so much. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. See you all again soon. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you have any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And finally, if you like what we do, whether it's our podcast or our videos or even our features, please head over to our Patreon page and support us there. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.